The scripture lesson for this morning is a little unconventional. It comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 1 through 24, or excuse me, 25. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders of Israel, its leaders, judges, and officers. They presented themselves before God. Then Joshua said to the entire people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors lived on the other side of the Euphrates. They served other gods. Among them was Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor. I took Abraham, your ancestor, from the other side of the Euphrates. I led him around through the whole land of Canaan. I added to his descendants, and I gave him Isaac. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Mount Seir to Esau to take over. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt with what I did to them. After that, I brought you out. I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. The Egyptians chased your ancestors with chariots and horses to the Sea of Reeds. Then they cried for help to the Lord. So he set darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea down on them, and it covered them. With your own eyes, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. You lived in the desert for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They attacked you, but I gave them into your power, and you took over their land. I wiped them out before you. Then Moab's king, Balak, Zippor's son, set out to attack Israel. He summoned Balaam, Beor's son, to curse you, but I wasn't willing to listen to Balaam, so he actually blessed you. I rescued you from his power. Then you crossed over into the Jordan. You came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho attacked you. They were Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave all of them into your power. I sent the hornet before you. It drove them out before you and did the same to the two kings of the Amorites. It wasn't your sword or bow that did this. I gave you land on which you hadn't toiled and cities that you hadn't even built. You settled in them and are enjoying produce from vineyards and olive groves that you didn't plant. So now, revere the Lord. Serve him honestly and faithfully. Put aside the gods that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if it seems wrong in your opinion to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Choose the gods whom your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But my family and I will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, God forbid that we ever leave the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord is our God. He's the one who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. He's done these mighty signs in our own sight. He's protected us the whole way we've gone and in all the nations through which we've passed. The Lord has driven out all the nations before us, including the Amorites who lived in the land. So we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, you can't serve the Lord because he is a holy God. He is a, a jealous God. He won't forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you leave the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he'll turn around and do you harm and finish you off in spite of having done you good in the past. Then the people said to Joshua, no, no, the Lord is the one we will serve. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. And they said, we are witnesses. So now put aside the foreign gods that are among you. Focus your hearts on the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and will obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and established just rule for them at Shechem. Here ends the very long lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Amen.
Today's scripture lesson is a lengthy, lengthy conversation between Joshua, leader of the Hebrew masses following the death of Moses, and the people of Israel. Now, at this point in the history of the Hebrews, they've already entered the land of Canaan, and they've already begun the difficult work of building a new nation. But it's here at Shechem, which is going to become the first capital of a newly established Israeli nation, that the people are committed to renewing their vows to God. The covenant between God and Israel, which was established on Mount Sinai, actually resembles the language of a Jewish marriage contract, an actual document that lists the responsibilities of each party in a traditional Jewish wedding. In fact, I have such a document right here, and after the service, if you want to come up and take a look, you're welcome to do so. This is my marriage contract when my, li- my wife and I were, were wed. The language, you'll notice up top, is in the Hebrew. Now, that's very formulaic. The the English at the bottom is more of an interpretation. It's not an exact translation. It's designed to capture the spirit, but with our own little spin on it. Now, these marriage contracts, these ketubahs, vary in practice and form in the Jewish community today from couple to couple, but the general idea has remained consistent throughout. Each person is dependent on the other person in order for the relationship to function, Each person has certain responsibilities in order to flourish in the relationship. Both people have needs and both people have duties, one to the other. So this event in the book of Joshua is kind of like a recommitment ceremony. It's a vow renewal ceremony, a way of reminding the Hebrews all they've been through and with God's help, all they've accomplished. The language here is very formal. I'm sure you noticed that. Did you notice how it's almost like a call and response? First Joshua and then the people, then Joshua and the people. Joshua begins with a litany of God's mighty deeds. Then he asks the people to reformalize their commitment to God. Then, instead of just saying, yeah, sounds good, the people respond by repeating what Joshua has just said and then affirming their commitment. It's all very ceremonial. It's all very organized. But Joshua says something in the middle of this ritual that caught my attention this time. He says, specifically in verse 14, put away the gods that your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt, and worship the Lord instead. What I love about this passage in particular, and it's easy to get lost in the shuffle of all of that high language, is that it's unusually rational for a Bible verse about serving God. When we think today about being religious, about believing in God, we often call it an act of faith. We might even say it's a leap, a chance we take in believing that God is is real and that belief is worth it, even when things don't always go our way, even when we have doubts, even when we don't see or feel God as being close to us. But Joshua in this passage is actually talking in terms that I think our modern minds can understand. He's talking cost-benefit analysis. He lists out all the great things God has done for the people, and then he says, with that in mind, you've got a choice to make. Serve the God who gave you all this great stuff, or be a chump and take your chances with gods that may never show up at all. Now, if you're squirming right about now at all the God language, that's awesome. That's a good thing. In the United Church of Christ, we often get mighty uncomfortable when we hear scriptures read which criticize the beliefs or religious practices of other people. We struggle with passages of the Bible that seem to paint Jews or Christians as being superior to all other cultures and ways of life. So, if you heard the chapter earlier and you got a little nervous, you're in good company. But what I love about Joshua's language here is something that goes overlooked. The point here, at least as I see it, isn't in this case a boxing match between God, the God of the Hebrews, and all of these other cultures. Not that that never happens in scripture. It definitely does. And when it happens, we should talk about it. But I don't think that's what's happening here. What's happening here isn't merely about superiority. It's actually about values. 
For Joshua, there's an explicit direct connection between serving a particular God, in this case the Hebrew God, and all the benefits that brings. The freeing of slaves, the respect for the earth, the care of strangers who visit your lands because you were once strangers in Egypt. All of these commandments, all of these values and more come from the Hebrew God. So by throwing away all of these false gods, Joshua and the Hebrews are actually affirming what they think is fundamentally true about the world, about how they should live as human beings and what really matters. They're not just picking favorites. They're actually expressing a vision of how life should be lived, which is why I think this chapter is so relevant to us today. Few, if any of us, probably struggle with what God to worship if we're going to worship a God in the sense of, you know, worshiping the God of the Bible versus the God of the, I don't know, the Hittites or the Moabites or the Babylonians. Bonus points for anyone who can tell me what the names of any of those gods are. But that doesn't mean that we are not free from our own God struggles today. If our God is the thing or the being or the object that we value most, the key to understanding how our minds work and our worldview, the thing we want or need most in life, then I think it's pretty safe to say that our culture struggles with many, many false gods. We struggle with gods of power. It's a nice thing to be powerful, by the way. I remember the first time I had an assistant. This is actually the only time I've ever had an assistant. I was working as a, not because of what happened after, I'm, I'm just saying, this is the only time I had an assistant. I was working as a marketing director, and I finally had someone to whom I could delegate specific tasks. It was awesome. It was awesome because it actually helped me cut down on my own stress level. But it was also just kind of neat to be able to say, hey, would you mind taking care of this for me? And more or less trusting that it would get done. Now, I'd like to think, and I hope, that I never abused that power. But at the very least, I can appreciate how easy or how tempting it can be for some folks in powerful positions to be tempted to misuse their power. When you're powerful, boundaries become more fluid. Think about a recent news cycle with plenty of celebrities and politicians whose careers are forever marred by their tragic misuse of power. Lives who've been ruined because these people exploited the vulnerable. It's gotten so bad in recent days, particularly with celebrities, that my wife and I have started cringing with every headline fearful that some of our favorite entertainers would be exposed in some depressing way. Now, please don't misunderstand. It's a good thing, a necessary thing, when injustice is brought to light. But the disappointment comes in when someone you admired has such dark secrets. You know, I thought they had it all figured out. So that's why every time I open up my news feed these days, I say a silent prayer that the cycle of abuse will finally slow up. That by exposing these crimes, we can actually prevent future crimes from happening. All that to say, many in our culture worship power. Many also worship money, capital, finance, which is a kind of power all its own. Now this one, I'm really bad at. You've heard the expression impulse buyer? That's me, for real. How many times have I said to myself, if I just get this thing, how awesome would that be? If our house just had a white picket fence, if my car were a little more souped up, if my stereo had that subwoofer that I've always wanted, again and again, I stumble into the notion, unintentionally, that purchases, specific purchases, will make all the difference in the world. That they'll put me in a better mood, make my weekend more exciting, and so on. If you were to ask me, point blank, John, do you worship money? I would say emphatically, no, 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 I don't. But I do sometimes worship the idea of money. I do sometimes worship the idea that money is capable of doing anything more than simply helping me acquire more stuff. Sometimes I worship the idea of stuff, the idea of just having more versus less. 
I bought a television recently. My wife and I had agreed to a particular television, a particular size. But like the child whose mother gives him milk money and sends him to the store and he comes back with candy, I got to the store and wouldn't you know it, there was another television that was 10 inches bigger that was the same price. So when the delivery guy came to our house, my wife was shocked that this television that doesn't quite fit on the wall anymore because it's too big had been brought in. Needless to say, we had a very important, necessary, heart to heart about the fact that, you know, maybe we should have gone with the one that we chose initially. I worship the idea that more is always better. And that was my argument. But it was the same price, and it's more. It's the same thing, but better. Since disconnecting our cable, Lindsay and I watch fewer television commercials. But the other day, I went to the ophthalmologist, and there was a television in the waiting room. The sheer volume of commercials between program segments was overwhelming. And had you asked me then on the spot to remember the ads and what was in them, I don't think I would have been able to tell you even then and there. The culture of buy, 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 and spend, 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 especially as we get closer to the holidays, has its benefits. For one, I like living in a country where what I own more or less belongs to me where if I can afford something and I decide to purchase it, I can do so relatively easy. There's this thing now, Amazon.com. It's amazing. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me, but it's amazing. I enjoy following certain markets, like technology, for instance, with new trends and toys to play with. But every market has so many competitors, and all that advertising noise and static can be so overwhelming. So. Some of us, intentionally or unintentionally, worship money, or at least what it can get us. And there's also this kind of self-worship that happens in our culture, too. Now, I think self-esteem and self-respect and self-care are all important things, but self-absorption is incredibly toxic. It distracts us, and it keeps us away from those we want to love and care for. We can get so wrapped up in our own heads, our own needs, our own journeys, that we fail to notice the people sitting right beside us. Now this is made easier by all the emphasis on individualism that we find all around us. Sometimes I think we mistakenly attribute this individualism to American culture itself, as if the issue were something as simple as the war between capitalism and socialism. But I think that's an oversimplification. After all, the Americans of the 40s and 50s were frightened by the threat of communism, they didn't want to lose their individuality, but they also understood the value of rallying together around common causes. World War II would not have been the significant moral victory it was if not for those voices seeking American involvement. And while our track record during the conflict was far from perfect, as any Japanese American would gladly share with you, the fact remains that as a country, we attempted to join together to stamp out the Nazi threat, and with our help, the Allies succeeded. Now today, the kind of individualism that I'm talking about isn't freedom from being oppressed. It's freedom from having responsibility. It's freedom from each other. Thanks in part to new technologies, I can exist in my own little echo chamber, my own bubble. I can be whomever I want to be without any thought to anybody else. A recent ad for a mobile device proclaimed, I have the right to be unlimited. Now the ad was referring to the amount of data you have on your phone, and unlimited data is awesome, by the way. But the tone of the ad, which wasn't very specific, the tone of the ad left me uncomfortable. Because the further we burrow into our own little worlds, the further away we pull from one another. Sometimes we worship ourselves. I'm sure, if pressed, you could think of examples of your own, ways in which we as individuals or as a society at large worship things, people, and ideas that draw us further and further away from healthy values. Things that pull us away from our best selves, from each other, and from God. Which is why, I think, from time to time, each one of us needs our own Shechem moment, like the Hebrews in the story. In the Joshua story today, the people are confronted by the very real possibility that they can choose who and what to worship. 
they have the freedom to choose. They can serve the Hebrew God or they can chase the gods of other nations. But by reminding the people what God has done since freeing them from Egypt, by reminding them of Abraham's call from God to seek out a new land wherein to worship God, by reminding the people that there might be a better way, Joshua is calling them to remember the best way they can be. Last week, we talked about the value of memory, how memory actually frees us up. It gives us legs to stand on or shoulders on which to sit. It takes us to higher places. Well, in this story, Joshua is using the power of memory to charge the Hebrews. Put away the gods. Put away the rivals to your affections. Put away the false truths, the have-truths, the stumbling blocks to a new and better life. You're building a new nation one that can be free from at least some of the pratfalls and weaknesses of many of the nations that have oppressed and pursued you. So learn from their mistakes. Learn from your own mistakes and put them away. One last point on the subject of building a new nation. Earlier this year, I think it was in March, I had the chance to see the musical Hamilton in Chicago, a hip-hop show from Broadway about Alexander Hamilton, one of our nation's founding fathers, and probably the most brilliant economic mind our fledgling country had ever had. Throughout the show, the character of Hamilton debates how in building a new nation like America, we must consider the strengths and weaknesses of other countries. We must question and challenge their assumptions in order to take the best parts from them, produce new ideas, and abandon the things that hold us back. As the musical closes in the final number, as the cast take the stage all together one last time, they remind the audience that how we choose to live may actually end up resonating long, long after we're gone. Who tells your story? Like the story of the tiny nation of Israel, whose choice to worship the Hebrew God has resonated through thousands of years and even means something in our own lives today, our choices may seem small in the moment, but their repercussions can be huge. So that's the challenge I leave with each of us today, that we have the courage to examine the gods we may not even know we worship, gods of greed or nationalism or prejudice, gods of control or worry, gods of fundamentalism and religious dominance, industrial gods and technological gods and all those gods in between. Let us put away the gods and in doing so, rediscover not only the God who loves us, but rediscover our best selves. Amen.